Why are you doing this interview with me? Because I like you. <laughs> as simple as that. Well, don't say that in public. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anybody I would rather have on a show called Uncensored than you. Of course, you're smart. Will I get to the real you in this interview? 100%. What is the point of Dr. Jordan Peterson? What do you hope to achieve? Holy shit, this is where we're going with this interview, huh? When you hear about the impact on these poor families whose children, age six, were blown to pieces in a school, when you hear about the impact, do you have any real regret or remorse? There were tears that ran. You in jail. What was that like? Romanian jail is not English jail. I mean, describe it. What was the cell like? I have to be careful what I say because I don't want to insult the Romanian justice system, which I'm still beholden to. However, it's exactly as bad as people would expect it to be. Luckily, it was in the winter, so the cockroaches were not too bad. It was also during Ramadan, so I didn't have to eat so much, which was helpful because of the situation. I think the most stressful thing about it is I had no idea how long I was going to be in there for. I was dragged from my house. I was given papers in Romanian. I didn't know why I was there. I found out why I was there and it was garbage. I couldn't seem to get out. It, I could have been held for years. It's very stressful. And uh, the best thing you can do is turn to God and, and train as hard as possible. I did thousands of push-ups a day every Were single day. Were you in day. solitary this, in this period, three months? I, no, I wasn't in solitary the entire month, the entire time. Sometimes I was by myself. Sometimes I was with other guys. And sometimes I was with my brother. So, When you were on your own? Were they keeping you in there for 24 hours a day? Were you allowed out? No, I wasn't allowed out. There was no yard time. It was 24 hours a day, locked in a single room, probably three or four steps large, and you do nothing but stare at the wall. And you. Think How many days did you do that for, on your own? 11, 12. I mean, that's a pretty grim scenario for, for anyone. Life's grim. For you, always being Mr. Confident, you said, interestingly, that you wouldn't categorize what you were feeling as depression because you don't believe in the concept of depression. You and I have argued about that before. But it sounds to me from what I've seen you say when you've talked about this, that that was pretty close to depression, what you were feeling. Life's grim. And if you want to be a superhero, you have to understand in every single superhero movie, he is losing for 80% of the movie. He's going to suffer for the majority of the movie before he wins at the end. I've always wanted an exceptional life, Pierce, and I'm not a coward. And I knew that by telling the truth about certain issues, I was going to pay the price for it. So. I won't say that I deserve to be in jail, but I certainly put myself in there by telling the truth to the populace and telling the truth and living. But when you're on your own in that cell, what were you thinking? It's a long time to self-reflect, right? It certainly is. And I think my number one concern when I was in jail, despite the fact that my situation was dire, were my concerns as a man and all the people I have to take care of and my children and my family and the people I pay for and all the people who work for me. And truthfully, I wasn't worried about myself. I was worried about everybody else. And I think that's the true masculine frame. Did you get emotional? Did you shed tears in yourself? I'm an emotional man. I think, I think men are hyper emotional. We just have to control it. I was extremely busy inside of my jail cell. I had lots of push-ups to do. I was very concerned about the people on the outside. I was trying my best to get out. It's difficult for me to answer the question because it was an interesting frame of mind. I knew that God was watching and I had to perform. It's very difficult for me to go through life saying, I'm the top G, I'm this, I'm that, and speak about mental resilience and mental toughness. And then the second I'm thrown inside of a solitary confinement cell, cower out. I'm not that person. There's, what some other, there's some other people who talk about mental toughness and want to mm. give advice, and when bad things happen to them, they end up addicted to prescription drugs. I'm not a coward and I'm not a liar. No, but, but it would be perfectly natural to be emotional in that scenario, and there's no shame in admitting that. I was emotional. I missed people. Mm. I missed them, and I knew they missed me. So I felt a long, I felt a strong sense of missing. But you cried. There were tears that ran down my face, but I did not cry. I mean, that's crying. I would disagree. Well, I can't think of anybody I would rather have on a show called Uncensored than you. Of course, you're smart. <laughs> have we gone mad, Roseanne, in our world? When I look at all the fallout to the things that you say or do, um, I look at the sort of apoplexy that people bring to jokes, to humour, to sarcasm, to irony, all these things, and I, I, I really despair. The, the very essence of comedy, for example, is being expunged from human life. Yes, it is. 
Uh, yeah, well, you should despair, Piers, and so should anybody who has a brain or, um, you know, any humanity whatsoever or any connection to any other human beings on Earth, they should despair, too. Um, I say that they are weaponizing stupidity, and people have sunk to such a level, level that they can't handle satire, because satire is when you take two disparate subjects and bring them together to defamiliar, defamiliarize reality, such as a poet does with words, defamiliar, defamiliarize reality. And they cannot hold two disparate ideas in their head at the same time because they're fed 24-7 over the media. Obviously, you like saying, you know, outrageous things. And I like that about you, actually. I think more people should be doing this I love in life. It. Um, but but it, it seems to me you don't necessarily fall out with even your nearest and dearest over it. Have we all just got too sensitive? Are we too over-offended? Should we just be able to say outrageous yeah. things and then have a drink and a laugh with each other? Check it out, Pierce. The people that are saying everything's offensive are walking down the street swinging their penises in kids' face dressed. <laughs> Those are the people who say <laughs> offensive. The <laughs> Hey, hello? I well, say women, was that this is my advice to today's woman. Keep your penis in your pants, especially when children are around women. Roseanne, I, d I think we've certainly lived up to the billing of uncensored. When you hear about the impact on these poor families whose children, aged six, were blown to pieces in a school, when you hear about the impact, do you have any real regret or remorse? about fueling Adam this Lanza idea that it was staged children. and hoaxed and they were comic You let me antics. talk at all? Adam Lanza killed those children, not me. A Democratic Party PR firm looked at Trump, looked at me in 2016. That wasn't my question. Brought up Sandy Hook. That wasn't but, my no, question. I'm going to explain to you again. I'm going to say it again. The media took what I said out of context they didn't. years later, magnified it. Let me finish. To make a political hit point on me and on Trump, and they blew it all up and then said I was doing it. They have no proof I ever sent anybody to their houses. I didn't. I a few times questioned it on air. I became super famous. You said it was a hoax and a fake. To me. They've raised hundreds of millions in, in, in donations, 73 million from Remington. Now they're coming after the First Amendment. It's insane. And I told you, I'd come on and briefly talk about Sandy Hook. You sent a whole list of topics. Now, I want you to be true to your word and not a deceptive person, Pierce. We have spent 24 minutes on Sandy Hook. I want to move on to the Davos group. I just want you to answer the, the question the first. Before we move on, do I, you I mean, feel... My... When, you hear these, when you hear these accounts of what happened to these families, do you feel a sense of personal regret and remorse that your you know, actions on like air, these... that your actions yes, on air I, I inspired, don't feel as much inspired as the five... a lot of because... people to think these people were actors and their kids didn't really die? Do you feel genuine five... remorse? You know, let me talk for any... 500,000 Iraqi children starved to death. No, and that's Madeline not the Albright question. did it on purpose. And said, oh, oh, you know, no, I feel way less... No, I legitimately question Sandy Hook, and I stand by what I did. You said it Those was a families, fake and a hoax. You let me finish? Attach themselves to me to raise money and to claim I'm doing things to them I didn't do to raise money and to try to take over my life, and no, I don't. I apologize before they sued me if I ever hurt anybody's feelings, and I'm supposed to apologize forever and ever in some communist I just asked struggle you session. If you, I just asked you whether you feel regret Infowars. and remorse. Com. I asked you whether you feel regret and remorse for fueling this belief that Sandy Hook was staged and fake. That's the only question I asked you. When you give an apology, which I've given over 150 times, you're done with the apology. Type in Alex Jones apologizes for Sandy Hook. You'll have it before they sued me, so I'll point you to that. You're so good at all your clips, but no, I'm not going to come back on your show in 10 years and you'll say, do you now apologize? If I sat here and slit my throat on air, it wouldn't be enough for you. I legitimately question mass events because of things like Operation Northwoods that called for staging mass shootings that didn't occur in the United States. Look it up, ABC News, Operation Northwoods. I came on here, Piers, to have a real discussion with you and ask for money. Imagine the biggest settlement ever, fentanyl, uh, settlements for Oxycontin, settlements that have killed millions of people, and this settlement is way bigger. And they say Jones refuses to pay. I don't have 
$5 million, much less a billion and a half dollars. So when they say I refuse to pay, if I have three gallons of blood in my body, and they say we want a thousand gallons. I don't have a thousand gallons of okay. blood. The the debate about what constitutes free speech and whether there should be limits and if there should be what they are, I think is really interesting. And a lot of people have strong opinions about this. And I'm perfectly happy to be proven wrong or to at least have a debate with someone who's got strong views that don't necessarily tally with mine. So I welcome you to the program. Um, let's start with your assessment that I'm a free speech hypocrite. So articulate to me why you believe that. I, I believe the word I used there was was fraud. You earlier used hypocrite. Did I earlier? Okay, I don't remember saying it, but <laughs> I'll take your word for it. And uh, to some degree, I believe it. Look, I, I think that in hosting a show uncensored, and I can't see you, but I know you put up the very festive uh, holly leaf on the, on the globe there. <laughs> um, it is incumbent upon you. You will say, I believe in the concept of free speech. Now, I will, I'll be very clear in my definition of free speech. It's the constitutional definition of freedom of speech. All speech is permissible outside of a crime. And we have very clear parameters, and these have been affirmed by the Supreme Court, as to what that is. That's a proactive call for violence. The crime is not the speech. The crime is the action causing violence on purpose. Outside of that, everything is permissible. But for a show uncensored, and I know that you've said there's a difference between across the pond there, and obviously in the United mm -hmm. States, we have a First Amendment that you don't. Um, how would you define freedom of speech? Well, what I is permissible? Think, see, I don't think we're as far apart as you think. I mean, you talk about the First Amendment not protecting, for example, crime. It's a little bit more complicated. For example, it doesn't protect you if you deliberately defame somebody. And my argument about Alex Jones in particular was that he's just been uh, punished with over a billion dollar fine uh, in one of the biggest defamation cases in modern American history for deliberately mm -hmm. telling lies about the families of the poor victims of the Sandy Hook massacre over a sustained period of time, which led to them getting direct harassment and other criminal activity. So I was joining all the dots there of his particular situation, and I concurred with Elon Musk's original view when he was asked about it when he first bought Twitter last year, which was he was not going to allow him back on. He's now changed his mind, but my opinion was based on the Constitution of the United States not protecting you if you are guilty of defamation. Well, OK, so I'm going to have to take the rounds out of that magazine from how loaded that question was and so much misinformation there. And that's the beauty of the freedom of speech. You can say that, you can speak misinformation, and you have the right to, for example, saying he knowingly lied. Look, I'm not in the he business did. of defending everything that Alex Jones, everything that Alex Jones has said, okay? Mm. But if you're going to say the 22 minutes out of 8,000 hours of broadcast time for which he apologized, acknowledged that he mm. was wrong, constitutes what you are saying is proactively lying. That is a very dangerous no, precedent. But he did, yeah, but and no, it's no, not hang accurate. On, hang on, Stephen. It's listen. not accurate. Stephen, he did deliberately lie for a sustained period of time, for years, about these families. He knew Sandy Hook. Tell me Hook. how he deliberately lied. He knew that Tell me how he deliberately he lied. He deliberately lied. And he was found to have deliberately lied. Tell me how he lied. deliberately lied. And by the way, in his, in his defense, he Tell tried... Tell me how he deliberately lied, in, please. In, in his defense, he tried to play the First Amendment card and it was rejected by the judge. Rejected. Tell me how he deliberately lied, please. Because he knew that it wasn't a hoax. He knew the massacre had happened. Let's incorrect. Listen to what he, listen to what he That's said. That's incorrect. Let's play, let's play what he said. Hook, it's got inside job written all over it. Sandy Hook is a synthetic, completely fake, with actors, in my view, manufactured. I couldn't believe it at first. People just instinctively know that there's a lot of fraud going on. Uh, but it took me about a year with Sandy Hook to come to grips with the fact that the whole thing was fake. Whole thing was fake, repeatedly. That's a series of different shows he did. You still was, haven't answered. You still haven't answered. That doesn't prove that he knowingly lied. Anything. But, but Look, you, Alex but, Jones hey, is wrong Stephen, about a lot. You're a very Alex smart. Alex Jones is wrong about a lot. Stephen, you and he, I disagree. Okay, but he's also a friend. Stephen, you and I disagree. Hang on. It, and I'm then going to respond to you. You and I disagree about many things. We agree about many too, right? You just, but on this that. on this point, you're a very smart guy. I wouldn't question that for a moment. You and I both know Alex Jones knew that that was not faked Sandy Hook. You and I both know that. So I have to spit the words out that you just tried to place in my mouth. I do not know that. I don't agree with the premise. Matt, well, congratulations on having the biggest movie in the world. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's been a staggering week for you. I mean, this it was a great film when I watched it originally because uh, it just basically kept asking the same question I've been asking on the show for the last year. Uh, but it's a question which flummoxes everyone from Supreme Court justices to male politicians here to anyone you care to think of in public life. Um, when you put it on Twitter and then it got suppressed and then Elon Musk intervened, what was your feeling about that whole process? Well, when they first when they first decided to censor it, it was kind of this feeling of, oh well, well here we go again because this is what we're used to from uh, from big tech. It's uh, you know every single big tech platform is run by the radical far left, and especially on this particular issue, um, they, they they don't want you to talk about it. They don't want it acknowledged. There are basic truths that aren't allowed to be discussed. We were just demonetized by YouTube uh, on misgendering grounds, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. We thought that Twitter would be different under Elon Musk, and then they kind of pulled the rug out from under us. And, and at first, for me, it was sort of this, OK, well, I guess Twitter is the same as all the rest of them, and, until Elon Musk, uh, as you say, intervened. And uh, next thing you know, where there are resignations and all these sort of things happening, happening over at Twitter in their, uh, in their brand safety department, um, which, which makes it clear that, uh, that, no, in fact, Twitter is the one exception. It's the one major big tech platform where free speech is allowed. So I was I was happy that of course how how it worked out, but also that this film, on top of dealing with the um, with the gender issue, also could uh, you know succeed in um, really a victory for free speech. I think it's a really important victory for free speech because if if it had gone the other way and yeah. Twitter had decided to keep this film censored, then that would set a uh, really dangerous precedent, I think, for uh, all the other platforms. Yeah, no, no question. Elon Musk said this in reply to someone who tweeted him. This was a mistake by many people at Twitter talking about the suppression of your film. It's definitely allowed. Whether or not you agree with using someone's preferred pronouns, not doing so is at most rude and certainly breaks no laws. I should know that I do personally use someone's preferred pronouns, just as I use someone's preferred name, simply from a standpoint of good manners. However, for the same reason I object to rude behaviour, ostracism or threats of violence, if the wrong pronoun or name is used, which I think is a pretty reasonable position. I mean, is that a position you would share? No, I, I mean, I don't personally share that position. I'm not going to use preferred pronouns. I'm going to use the pronouns that are that are accurate. You know, I, I just reject the concept of preferred pronouns. Uh, you, you, don't, you, you can prefer whatever pronoun you want or whatever adverb or you know, noun you want, but that doesn't mean that I have to use it. You don't get to put words in my mouth. However, uh, the, the position that Elon Musk has on this is uh, you know, it's a position a lot of people have. And at the very least, it respects free speech. So this is what he's going to do, but you can say what you want because you, you can't force someone else to share your perceptions. That's what the preferred pronoun thing is all about. Yeah. You know, they're trying to not only put words in your mouth, they want you to affirm their perception of reality. And uh, the idea that we would be forced to do that, either legally or even according to the um, terms of service of a big tech platform, is just, uh, it's just insane. Well, it is. And of course, the argument they use is was well, offensive. But of course, the whole point of free speech, really, at its heart, is that you should be allowed to offend people. I mean, that's the point of free speech. It's not that everyone agrees with each other. It's that you should be able to ve vehemently disagree or be offensive or rude, if you want, and people should be able to tolerate that because that's what happens in a free society with a thriving democracy that believes in free speech. Yeah, I, and, and that is the importance of free, free speech. And like I said, a lot of this story is, is about a victory for free speech, which is really important. But I also want to note that you know, what's happening here is on, is on an even deeper level because um, on the left, what they're trying to shut down, it isn't just speech generally, and they are trying to shut down speech, but they're trying to shut down true speech. Mm -hmm. So it's not just speech. It's, it's in particular basic fundamental truths of life that they're trying to right. stop us from saying, and, and that makes it all the more uh, dangerous and egregious. I mean, your issue with YouTube was they demonetized you effectively by saying that you had misgendered Dylan Mulvaney, who's this transgender influencer that, of course, has created Bud Light's uh, revenue by taking part in a, in a PR stunt for them, which enraged... The, the core customers at Bud Light. Um, what did that whole thing tell you? I mean, A, what happened to you guys in terms of, of the way YouTube responded, but also about what happened to Bud Light? Yeah, I think it shows that people are, as far as Bud Light goes, people are uh, exhausted by this. Uh, the left 
you know, they were able to run roughshod over the culture in, in Western culture generally for years. And I guess they assumed that there would never be any, that there would be, never be any pushback. And they kept going and kept going until normal people just finally had enough of it. And I wish we had enough of it much sooner. But, uh, but, it, but at least now, finally, that's, uh, the, you know, a line is being drawn. And I think one of those lines is when you're trying to get people again, trying to force them to af affirm and celebrate something that's just not true. Uh, at a certain point, I think it's uh, it's just it's too far for the average person. That's what we're seeing now. This is not despite what the left says. You know, this pushback against uh, LGBT pride and against the transing of kids. This is not some sinister right wing, well funded uh, conspiracy. This is really a this is a groundswell thing. This is uh, this is grassroots. These are just normal people who've had enough of it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And in Dylan Mulvaney's case, I mean, Dylan Mulvaney identified as a gay man until last year. And a lot of women have been genuinely outraged that Dylan Mulvaney has been putting out these videos, effectively mocking women, actually, if you look at them. And that's been my problem with what Dylan Mulvaney has done. So Dylan Mulvaney can, can call herself whatever she wants, I don't care. Um, what she can't do, I don't think, is make millions of dollars mocking the concept of womanhood um, when, until last year, she identified as a as a gay man and is clearly a biological male. And it's also the irony that we hear so much about the dangers of appropriation these days, uh, even when it comes to things like Halloween costumes, where someone is clearly just having fun and they put on a Native American Halloween costume, whatever it may be, we're told that that's, uh, that's horrifically racist and it's, it's uh, demonizing and it's a caricature mm -hmm. of the person who wearing the costume. Up. Well, well that's, that's exactly what Dylan Mulvaney is doing. He's, he's, uh, mm -hmm. he's making a caricature of womanhood. I have a, a, an ongoing theory that the world has gone nuts, but what I can't work out <laughs> is whether it's just because we're aware of more stuff which is nuts than we ever used to be, or do you actually feel oh, yeah. that it is going nuts? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> it is going nuts. I mean, we sort of touched it on in the show tonight when I was talking about norms and the attitude, I think, of the uh, conservative people in this country about what's, what disturbs them on the left I would think it's, I would say it's the fringe of the left, but you know, the problem with the left is that the people in the center who don't even believe what the fringe are believing don't stand up to them. They don't shout them down publicly, so it just becomes, it's very bad for Democrats, which I don't think is a good thing. I mostly vote for Democrats. I can't remember the last time I voted for a Republican. But um, the norms that Trump trounced on that's a very valid point, one I've made a million times, and we all saw it in plain sight. I mean, norms of the law and democracy and answering subpoenas and <laughs> respecting elections and not trying to have a coup in America. I mean, it went past norms, but their view is, okay, those are terrible norms perhaps to trample, but your norms have to do with like life itself. Right, like, biological <laughs> sex. Yeah, that, exactly. I mean, that, we had that debate tonight, it, yeah. and it's kind of baffling to me that we <laughs> are actually having to debate these right. things. <laughs> That's, that is what they're saying. I've, heard, I've, ta I've talked to these people all the time, because mm. I'm out in the country all the time, and they're like, you know, we're not all crazy. We just don't, we just don't feel comfortable. And uh, I've said this before, I'll say it again. A lot of them say to me, what you don't get about us and Donald Trump is we don't like him either. Mm. We just see him as a bulwark toward <laughs> against something that's even nuttier. Mm. Because as we know in America, people really don't vote for who they like. They vote for who they hate the least. Right. Um, and where are you with free speech now? Because it seems to me that as a comedian and a host, comedy has never been under more attack than it mm. is now. I mean, literally physical attacks now. Yeah on comedians on yeah. stage to try and suppress their right to tell jokes. What do you feel about that? I think that's exactly, I never feel like I'm about to be attacked on stage. It could happen tomorrow, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, but I, I, that's not something that, I, there's been a few instances, the Dave Chappelle one, obviously the Will Smith. Mm. I mean, these are outliers. We're not really attacked. What we comedians are afraid of is not being attacked physically on stage. We're afraid of being attacked on Twitter. Being canceled. Yes, that, I mean, I grew up in the age of the comedy club, and there's, comedy clubs are still out there, by the way, um, but you could, they were a place, as they say, to be bad, yeah. or a place, even if you weren't bad, if you had passed that point, to try out new material. Have we lost the ability as a society to accept being offended? Well, of course. 
and that's part of it. I mean, comedy has to find where the line is, you know. Oh, you crossed the line. Well, I'm the guy who's, I'm the, like the, the mind seeker. I'm out there with the bayonet, you know, digging into the ground to see where the mines are. And who okay? decides this line? Once in a while, one's going to blow up in our face. Right. But can who I decides... give me some credit for being the guy out there with the bayonet? And who decides the line? It, apparently teenagers right. who decide everything in this country because I feel like teenagers are the ones, or people with a teenage mentality, uh, who are, are the ones who fill social media with mm -hmm. condemnation because they were raised wrong with a sense of entitlement in a sense that anything that causes them the least amount of discomfort cannot be tolerated for even one second. Mm -hmm. So when they scream and cry, nobody says anything. That's my point about where are the people to push back? Where I are the adults? I don't think most, <laughs> I don't think most of the Democrats or most of the liberals in this country, old school liberals like me, are, are like this kind of stuff, but they don't shout it down. So if somebody does something that's a little bit outside the lines and there is a big complaint on social media, nobody stands up for them. And the problem is that nobody ever gets canceled for being too woke. Mm. So you can say the craziest thing, like men can have babies, mm. and then nobody will, even though people are thinking, well, that's kind of nuts, Nobody will say it. They'll just fall in line. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I've always thought, men can have babies, sure. What is your goal? What is, what is the point of Dr. Jordan Peterson? What do you hope to achieve through what is now huge global fame? Um, I hope to encourage people. Other than that, I want to see what happens. You know, I want to say what I believe to be true as clearly and, and carefully as I possibly can and I want to see what happens as a consequence. And what people don't understand about that in some sense is your, your happiness, the, the purpose of your life is not going to be happiness. Sometimes it is, sometimes that will come, but there will be difficult periods in your life and happiness won't suffice then. But what you can have in your life is an adventure. You can have an adventure. And the truth is the best adventure. There's no doubt about that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, you don't know what's going to happen if you say what you think. Now, I don't mean incautiously, and I don't mean provocatively or any more than necessary. You don't know what's going to happen. So that's very adventurous. But also, if it's you and your voice, then it's your adventure. And if it isn't, like if you're crafting your mm. speech or manipulating in any way, or parroting or abiding by the dictates of the crowd, then I don't know whose adventure you're having, but it's not yours. See, and I'm I'm on the show Piers Morgan Uncensored because, ironically, I got censored. Mm -hmm. I was doing a morning show at another network, and after the Meghan Markle, Prince Harry interview on Oprah Winfrey, I said I didn't believe a word that she was saying, Meghan Markle. And I was told I had to apologise oh, for yeah. this. And I said, well, why would I apologise for an honestly held opinion? There's a question. I, I didn't believe it. Uh, but I was told you, either you apologise or you lose your, your job. Yeah. So wow. I took the losing the job option rather than compromise my free speech yeah. idea. Was that a good idea? Yes, I Why? think so. Well, because ultimately I think you've got to be true to yourself. Well, right? or you're I mean, true to something else. Well, <laughs> I, I think we're in a weird world actually driven by people like Meghan Markle where she talks about my truth. Yeah. I don't understand what my truth means. It means do what I want. Right, but my truth doesn't actually exist. There is the truth which is fact-based yeah. and unarguable, and then there is opinion yeah. around fact and truth. Yeah. You can't have your own version of the truth, it seems to well, me. Well, you have, it's complicated because when people say that, they, they are referring to the, to the degree that they're referring to anything, that, that there are some experiences that are in some ways purely subjective, and they're also valid in their subjectivity. So for example, if you're sitting there and you say, I'm in pain, and it's, assuming I believe you're not manipulating mm. me, I don't have access to that pain, but I'm, it's reasonable for me to assume that that's a genuine experience on your part and act accordingly. And so there is a realm where experience is valid that's subjective, mm. but that doesn't mean that everything that happens to you subjectively is now to be regarded by fiat as the truth I have to abide and by. Shouldn't we, in a, in a democracy, should it not be my right to listen to you with great respect, and then say, I don't believe a word of what you just said. Well, it's also your responsibility. It's not just your right. And it's also one of the things people don't understand is that that ability of the other person to oppose or rein in 
or satirize or dance with or joke or play with, all of those things, they're also what keeps you together and sane because we all have a tendency to drift in our weakest place, let's say. And so some people become alcoholic and some people will become narcissistic and, and so on. We all have our temptations. And one of the ways we buttress ourselves against that is by having other people say, no, you, there you're not funny, there you're boring, mm -hmm. there you need to be reined in. And if you deprive yourself of that, that's what happens to hyper celebrities and dictators. They deprive themselves of that social regulation because mm -hmm. they forbid it and then they're, then they're in hell. And sometimes they drag everyone along with them, too. So, <laughs> yeah, really. It's, on free speech, it seems to me, in my 57 years of being on this planet, that free speech has never been under more ferocious attack, not mm -hmm. in places you would expect, like authoritarian regimes, mm -hmm. but actually in, in democracies. I never mm -hmm. thought I'd, I'd come to a day in my lifetime where people were literally being fired mm -hmm. or, in some cases, imprisoned for expressing honestly held opinions, even if I find those opinions grotesquely wrong or offensive. Yeah, you know, it's worse than that. P people underestimate the significance of this because it isn't, we're not having a fight about who has the right to speak freely. That's nothing, that's, that's, that's a peripheral problem, even though that can be serious in and of itself. We're having a fight about whether or not your claim that free speech exists is nothing but a masquerade for your willingness to dominate and use power. And mm. so if I was taking that tack, I'd say, it's all well and good for you to speak about free speech, but look, you're white and you're middle class and you're British and, mm. you're, and you're privileged, and you have this theory about free speech that your ancestors derived, but the only reason they ever derived that to begin with is so they could exercise their power. Mm. There's no such thing as free speech. That's just a lie to mask a power claim, and that's a way worse cynical criticism of the notion of free speech, then you can't speak because I don't agree with it. I mean, it's a, it's a form of fascism, isn't it? I mean, these people- It's worse than that. The, the kind of, the, the ultra woke uh, brigade out there, they, they categorize themselves as liberals, but there's nothing liberal about that mentality. When you have a cancel culture, which is driven by, if you don't agree with what I say, you're gonna get shamed, vilified, canceled, fired, maybe even in prison. That is actually what fascist regimes do to people, to their populace. Yeah, but the fascists are more straightforward about it because they basically come out and say something like, shut up or we'll beat you. Right. Whereas the compassionate types who are narcissistic compassionate, compassionate types, they come out and say, well, we're really trying to save the world, you know, and we're, we're acting in everyone's best interest and we think it would be better if, if you should just, you know, regulate what you say. Well, let me, be, let me just put this on the table. Uh, I've actually grown to really like you, and that may be the worst thing you hear from me all day, but I, I actually have because Thank you. I watched the, the Netflix uh, thing, uh, found out a lot more about you, about your life, about your upbringing, what you'd come through, um, and the honesty I felt that you brought to what you'd gone through and the self-awareness that you had, I felt, I mean, look, I, I wouldn't use a phrase as patronizing as it felt like you'd grown up, but it definitely felt like you'd evolved as a human being and were able to look back mm. on that period when we first locked horns and recognize that that was not a path yep. to any glory. That was just going to be completely self-defeating. Would that be, would that be fair? Yeah, I think we all, we all grow up at our own, um, at our own pace, but yeah, I definitely look up. To look where I was in 2016, where you and I had the run in and look, a bit of credit would have been nice from you. I mean, it was fourth round of Wimbledon against one of the greatest of all time. I thought True. that in itself was a pretty good achievement. But um, <laughs> yeah, look, I've grown up um, immensely. Um, I look back at, you know, those Twitter beefs that I've had. I've had one with you, I've had one with Drake. And I just look back and I'm just saying like, these are just so, so silly. And uh, when I've met all these people that I've had beef with, we actually get along extremely well. I mean, I could imagine that you and I could go for a beer and for a drink and we'd have a great time with all the stories and experiences that we've both had. But yeah, that... I guess that Netflix um, series was really good for me personally because it gave a bit of background into, you know, people think that I've been entitled and got given everything off a plate. But, you know, when I was young, I, my family didn't have much. You know, I had to kind of work for everything that was thrown my way. And, yeah, I went through my own struggles and it was common struggles that most people do go through. So that's why I'm very relatable. So I think that's why it was very important. You've just retired. Yes. Something I don't think you probably thought would ever happen. You worried about it happening. You were concerned about it happening. What's the reality been like? I'm, I just retired three months ago. 
And uh, I agree with you that if I wanted it or, or not is different, but I accepted it because in the end I was not feeling good. I could have continued. I could have continued suffering in physical way and uh, keep going, but I wanted to feel good and I didn't want to have a consequence after my career where I'm limping or I cannot do things with my boys. So I choose to, to stop and I think I stopped in the right moment. But to be honest with you, when I see all the other strikers out there, I could still play because I, I would do much more than them and better than them. <laughs> and that's not for my ego, that's you wanna, facts. You want to name some names? <laughs> I could give you many names, probably 95% of them out there. So You think you're better than 95% even now? I am better, I don't think. <laughs> I take you also. I would take you also. Okay. Could be, could be. I had a chance to go there. But... I know you did. We're going to come to that. It breaks my heart. I can't even, <laughs> I can't even think about it. Um, we're at the Shaftesbury Theatre, one of London's great theatres here. You're used to being on the big stage. This is one of the big stages of theatre. It's an empty crowd. There's no one here. Yeah, just, just a few you, people. You should have brought me the crowd. Because <laughs> well, I wanted to see how you I would, I would make them bounce. <laughs> well, you would. You would. 100%. How are you going to deal with not having the big crowds? Being I on the big stage with a big crowd and now, now this? I think I don't need that. I, I've, I've been doing it for 20 years, 25 years. I played in front of 90,000 and uh, I made them bounce, I made them cheer, I made them whistle, I made them hate, I made them love. So all these things and uh, I don't have that ego that I need attention now because I am who I am. I'm remembered for what I did on the field, so I'm not looking for attention. I'm not looking for get recognized and uh, and all those things because, or else I would choose to be a commentator. I would do those things that you have these ex players doing because they're doing it because they still miss the attention. They want to be seen in front of the camera and uh, and I understand them because when you're on the field, you feel alive. And when you go there, you get this adrenaline. You feel the grass, you feel the duels, you feel the, the heat, you feel the, the atmosphere. And then depending on what kind of player you are, I'm a very emotional player when I'm on the field. So I switch from one thing to another thing. And uh, But now it's a different thing. Now I, I will live, a let's say, a normal life and uh, hopefully a normal life. What were you feeling? about what was going on at United and what did you feel generally about the club itself and the state that the club was in compared to when you'd been there before? Pierce, to be honest, when I, I signed for Manchester United, I thought everything was changed because it's 13 years that I changed. Uh, I was in Real Madrid nine years and three in Juventus and when I arrived, I thought everything will be different, you know, the technology, the infrastructures and everything, but I was surprised in a bad way, let's say, in that way, because I saw everything was the same. Uh, and Manchester said it wasn't, it wasn't in that moment that, as you mentioned, that all he was sunk. Michael Carrick, he, he assumed the, the, the job for two, two games, Villarreal and uh, Chelsea away, um, and everything was was so fast, but surprised me a lot. Uh, instability in the club. Um, everything was kind of the same that I that I hadn't moved on. No, they they stop on 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 the clock, in my opinion, which is something that that surprised me. I didn't expect, and um, slowly and slowly they start to change. Even even the the windows, the new players and. Um, was tough, was tough for me, because I didn't expect that. And because uh... when you were there before, if Manchester United wanted a player under Sir Alex Ferguson, they normally got their man. Right now, it's a very different environment after many years of failure since Sir Alex retired. United weren't getting the top players anymore. So were you surprised by that dynamic changing as well? Because you would have been used before to them. If they wanted top players, they got them. I was surprised. I thought when I signed that they signed in that year Sancho and Varane plus me, 
that things will be in the way that Manchester should be. As you mentioned well, Sir Alex Ferguson left a big gap in the club. Not only Sir Alex Ferguson, but one person that I thought would make the difference, uh, David Gill, mm. the president, a very, very good man. And uh, the structure around Sir Alex Ferguson was very important too. I knew it that Manchester United wasn't the same, but I don't see that it was so big gap, so big things that go through by the last 10 years. And it was the thing that surprised me more, to be honest. It was little things like even the, the swimming pool that the players use, the saunas, all these facilities. Nothing had changed since you'd left in 2009. Nothing changed. Surprisingly, not only the pool, the jacuzzi, even the gym. Even some points the technology, the kitchen, the chefs, <laughs> which is I appreciate, lovely, lovely persons. They stop in a, in a time which is, is, it surprised me a lot. I thought I will see different things, different, as I mentioned before, technology, infrastructure. Um, but unfortunately, we see many things that I'm used to see when I was 20, 21, 23. So surprised me a lot. Your relationship with your parents obviously complicated, difficult. Um, I know you don't particularly like talking about that. I don't want to pry into, into that. Other than to just ask whether it's had a material effect on you as a person. Do you think a lot of the drive that you have comes from those difficulties and those difficult relationships? You're right, I don't like talking about it, but it's a great question. And, and I would say yes, absolutely. My relationship with my parents has, has definitely, uh, you know, made me who I am today in many different ways, not just, you know, in life and in business, but as a father, too. So I, I wouldn't change my upbringing, not one thing about it. I wouldn't change any of it. So, um, yeah, great question, and I agree with you. Has it made you a better father yourself, do you think, a better parent? 100%. 100%. My parents taught me a lot about what I didn't want to be as a parent. And, uh, yeah. And, and I don't really talk about, I don't think I've ever talked about this, but my parents both died recently. So, I um, know that. That, yeah, so that's, that's uh, yeah, I don't I, like talking about it. But, yeah, my parents died recently. And, and uh, how did that make you yeah. feel? given how difficult things have been? Um, holy shit, this is where we're going with this interview, huh? I, uh, I, uh, I, I don't know, you know, I'm good with it. I'm, I'm good with everything, you know? I, I focus a lot on my kids and, and uh, my relationship with them, and I've sort of put my relationship with my parents behind me. Did you feel sad when... You knew they died, or did you no. feel it was the end of a... No, I... I well, I, di I didn't wish any ill will on either one of my parents, but, you know, no, I, I, I didn't... When they passed away, I, I had... Uh, I had almost no, no feelings about it, to be honest with you. You didn't go to their funeral, funerals, either of them? Yeah, listen, I took care of my... I took care of my father and, and uh, moved him up to Maine and... and, and you know, uh, put him to rest with his family up there. And then my mother, I, I had nothing to do with any of hers. Her, her family handled, uh, you know, her when she passed away. I mean, it's obviously, it's an extraordinarily sad part of your life. And obviously, I didn't know that your parents had both died recently. And I, I thank you for sharing that uh, very private information. I appreciate it. But I am curious as to, you acknowledge that the drive that you have, a lot of that may have come from this quite rough time you had, but do you, do you feel a great loss that you didn't have the love of your parents that many other people take for granted? You sound like my wife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to. Well, actually, maybe no. I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I did not feel that way. And, uh, uh, but there's no doubt about it. I, I, I cannot deny the fact that the way that I am built and the way the drive and all the things that I have uh, definitely come from the relationship that I had with my parents. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Um, 
But no, I have no remorse. I don't feel bad about the way that I grew up. I, I, I mean it when I say that I wouldn't change one thing about the way that I was brought up because I truly believe uh, had I not had them for parents, had I not had the upbringing that I, that I did have, that I wouldn't be who I am today. That, what that's what are the things, uh, Dana, what are the things that, you, that it taught you not to do as a parent and what are the things that it taught you to do as a parent? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the to do's is I, I'm, I'm here for my kids. You know, I, I've been married for almost 30 years. You go through, you know, a lot of things in a marriage. I mean, I just went through some stuff last New Year's Eve. Uh, you know, these things happen. What you don't do is you don't leave. You don't quit. You don't give up and, and you stay you know, you don't stay together just for your children, but you, you stay. I made a commitment. 22 years ago, I had my first son, and there's a commitment there to everybody that's involved. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've stayed in there. I'm, I'm always there for my kids, anything that they ever need. Um, and, and, you know, my father taught me you know, what it feels like to not have a father there at the house, what it's like to not have that, that, that person around all the time when you need them. And I would never do that to my kids.